Let's go through the advantages of this. The framework itself is elegant because it's simple. And when you look at a piece of work uh, done on the Toby system, I think your first reaction might be, that looks pretty clever, that's pretty neat. The basic ideas, as I've explained them in about 2 minutes and 15 seconds, um, is, uh, is very easy to understand. There's a central role, not for pitch that we perceive with our ears, but for, uh, the abbreviation is F0, fundamental frequency. This is the frequency of the vibration of your vocal folds, and it's something which is objectively measurable. You can use a computer and you can work out. If, if, if two people disagree, if two experts, one of them says uh, that's high followed by low, and the other person says no, it's high followed by high, but with a slight down step, you can say, okay, one of us is right, one of us is wrong, the computer will decide. And then you get the computer to analyze the fundamental frequency, which you equate to pitch, and, and it's settled. So the central role of fundamental frequency gives it a degree of objectivity. Well, I've already mentioned the testing of inter-transcriber inter agreement. Uh, the people working on Toby tried to extend this to other languages, uh, so that, uh, for example, there have been Toby treatments of, uh, of German, of Hungarian, of Swedish, uh, a number of other languages. Now the disadvantage is, because I'm afraid it all went wrong, as far as I'm concerned, it was uh, something which had a, a, a great beginning. It was a, a lovely golden dawn. Um, and then doubts began to creep in. A number of people who didn't get enthusiastic about this said, well, hang on, you're saying that fall rise, for example, is a high and a low and a high. Well, is this really true? It might be convenient to write it like that, but, and I now I actually believe this myself, there is something special about a contour like fall rise or rise fall. It is the contour itself, it's the global shape of it, not the fact that it starts low and then goes to a high point and then goes to a low point. It is a contour, <coughs> and contours were not part of the basic uh, uh, equipment of this system. It, they, a contour was something at a higher level that you made up out of these uh, building blocks, the, the, uh, the low tone and the high tone. And more and more I came to feel that this, uh, the importance of contours was being neglected in Toby. Inevitably, given that pe the people working on this were academics, the simplicity of the original idea was very quickly spoiled by adding on more and more and more details until the original idea, which was so easy to understand, became covered in details that made it impossible to understand unless you read all of the papers and attended all of the meetings uh, over three or four years. It became intensely complex. People started saying, Toby's fine, but for my language, we need a special version of Toby. And this happened with German, for example. Half the phoneticians in Germany said, we like this, we'll go with it. And another half, led by a well-known professor, said, German is special. We will have our German Toby. Uh, and they produced a variety that was different. And that the French said, oh, well, French is different too, so we must do our own. And pretty soon you get this dilution where there isn't a single Toby system. It, uh, it, it uh, becomes a whole lot of little local uh, varieties. I said how good I thought it was that we, um, in Toby, used the fundamental frequency as a crucial piece of evidence. But there's another side to that. Fundamental frequency is not intonation. Fundamental frequency is a physical counterpart to intonation, but intonation really is in your head and in your ears. It is not what a computer measures. And so it's possible, for example, uh, and I've done this many times, um, it's possible to look at a, a, a line or a, at a contour on a computer screen and say, oh, well, that begins with a fall before it becomes a rise. But what you have to say is, is that fall big enough for the human brain to detect? And often it is not. If you go have a transition from a voiced 
plosive or a voiced obstruent into a vowel or a voiceless obstruent into a vowel, there's a little time when the pitch will be either rising or falling, sorry, when the fundamental frequency will be either rising or falling. On a computer screen, it looks big and clear, but the human ear and the human brain don't detect it. It is therefore not possible to claim that that has any linguistic importance at all. But you can still write a paper on it and send it to a journal and prove that there's a rise in English that nobody knew about. Some people believed everything that they saw in terms of computer analysis of fundamental frequency. And finally, uh, and a very big mistake, I think, was that the phonologists and the um, speech scientists who developed this system never found the time to encourage people to produce pedagogical material. There were some very good training manuals produced to teach you how to use the Toby transcription, but never in any sense was there uh, an encouragement to say, how would a learner of English make use of a transcription like this? Um, that was, just, uh, just, uh, they, they more or less said, let the guys in the education department figure that one out, we'll concentrate on our theory. And uh, I think it missed a big opportunity there. And although people are still working with Toby or something like Toby, and there have been some interesting cross-language comparisons. There was a book by um, Daniel Hurst and Albert de Cristo published um, five, six, seven years ago, I think, which attempted to... This is, this is a good example of what happens with academics in groups. Um, Hurst and de Cristo said, the Toby framework, or something like it, has become so popular, we could do lots of languages, all treated the same way, and put them in one book. Great idea. They got uh, more than 20 phoneticians in different countries, and they did Arabic and Bulgarian. But each person wrote in and said, actually, I'm going to use my own system because I'm not very happy with what you want me to use. And if you read that book, um, the description of it is... is Fabulous. It's just what we want, to see 20 different languages, all described in the same way. And then you start reading them, and some of them, it, it's clearly the part of the PhD thesis of the guy who wrote it, and some of it is written for the, uh, I don't know, the approval of the local ministry of education. It just does not look like a consistent collection. So, um, the... Uh, uh, the Toby system, I think, is not going anywhere, uh, as far as I can see. Again, I may be, this may be a prejudice of mine that's, that's, that's not true, but I'm afraid that's the way I feel about it. The other, other final thing is, Toby only works if you're transcribing with a computer. Um, and I don't think it ever occurred to the people doing this that there are still uh, some people in the world who don't have a computer. Uh, you can... You can, if you have a, a big piece of paper and a lot of skill, you can do something that looks like a Toby transcription. But a full Toby transcription not only is highly complex, but it must be linked explicitly to the, uh, the acoustic signal that's stored in the computer. If you can't link it in time to the exact physical recording, then it's not a true Toby transcription. So it has to be done on a computer, um, and that's, that's a big drawback.